On the Area 58 uh, Archives Committee, I uh, just moved out to Oregon in, um, in the spring of this year, about six months ago, and went looking for some service work, and they kindly took me in because I told them I was willing to do some of the grubby stuff. <clears throat> so um, what I'd like to talk about is a draft of uh, a, an Archives Committee group inventory. And the way this came about was, uh, if, you, if you remember at the International, those of you who are there, I had the opportunity to speak for a little bit about uh, some project management, process management principles that are real helpful, very practical kinds of tools that we can use. And one of those is taking an inventory. This is, I'm talking about the plan, do, check, act cycle. And the checking part means you check your work, check and see how the project is going. You just check, are you getting the kind of results out of your committee that you uh, really wanted to get? So after giving that talk, I realized like, wow, we don't have any way of checking. I just went on at great length about how, what a good thing this would be, and we don't have such a thing. So I drafted these up. And kind of using the, um, the AA group inventory, um, the generic one, as, as a basis, but tried to make it more specific to archives. So this is in draft form, and I would very much welcome any feedback from people because I just going over it again, I see like, oh, I'd change that, oh, I would add this, but this is a draft, and the, the techies among us are talking about putting up some kind of a sharing place on the internet, not a website, but kind of a discussion and uh, document exchange kind of a place where we can do these sort of things. And they, it can evolve and uh, be made certainly much better. But with that in mind, I'd like to start into this. Number one is, what is the basic purpose of our group? Now, that's kind of a loaded question. We know Tradition 5 says the basic purpose of any AA group is to carry the message. Do we have a written mission statement or other document to guide our work? Uh, a mission statement might sound like an unnecessary formality, but I found them real useful in projects um, where We'll get into a project and we'll start thinking of all kinds of neat things we could do and we run off in all kinds of weird directions and sooner or later come back to the mission statement and go, oh, okay, well, we don't need to do that. That's not in the scope of our mission here. Uh, so it helps to keep us online. It reminds us of what's important. Number two, what more can our group do to carry the message? Do our public displays attract and inform members about our local origins, history, and AA principles? And this kind of gets back to what Gail was talking about. We have a tendency, I think, and this is, I think there's a little bit of collector in all of us. We want to show like, wow, this is all the stuff we have. And isn't it great we have all this stuff? But if we're not telling a message, carrying the, the basic AA message with it, and showing uh, the development of the AA fellowship and the principles, and particularly in our own areas and, and uh, districts and groups, then we're really not addressing the basic reason for all of this. Number three, do we adequately include the local origins and history of AA among minorities? If we get people who are not like us coming into our groups and they don't see themselves, in the materials we have on display, they're not going to be attracted. And we particularly want to attract them to AA, but we also definitely want to attract them into archives work because we can use all the volunteers we can get. Number four, do we attract, train, and motivate committee members so they become committed contributors? And, and again, Gail mentioned, and it's, I've found it true, that if you give people things to do and show them how they can be useful, it's a lot better than just making them sit through a committee meeting. So I was, uh, I was the archives chair for Area 32 for a while, and what I started doing was uh, we had scanned a whole bunch of uh, area minutes that were in the possession of someone else. The, the area didn't own its own history, so we scanned all these minutes, thousands of pages, and then at the... At the uh, uh, archives committee meetings, I would bring in photocopies of those, or printed out copies, and pass them around and give everybody a, a marker 
a highlighter and say, go through these things and mark out keywords. <coughs> you know, a keyword could be like, uh, well, in this year we determined how we were going to reimburse delegates for their travel expenses. Or in another year we determined um, who the, uh, the, the officers were going to be and whether, it, whether they're going to have voting rights and, you know, things like that. So they would go through and mark them up and then I would put those into the index that we were building of what we had. We had all these minutes and I could tell you, yeah, we had 1956 through the, through the present, but if we wanted to find a topic which, you know, comes up periodically, somebody will say, didn't we vote on that uh, back uh, 10 years ago or so? Uh, how do you find it? Well, we had scanned all this stuff. They were old crummy photocopies of photocopies and they would not scan into optical character recognition. So be the best we could do was to put uh, keywords into our records. And that's, that's helpful. I don't think we had quite enough of these. Ah. Okay, yeah, we had, uh, what, 50 copies, I think. We can make more, and, and we'll be putting them up online. So, uh, do we obtain, this is number five, uh, do we obtain and provide training for the archivist, conservator, and other committee members to effectively carry out their duties? Um, it's, as has already been mentioned, I found that the historical society in, the, in my area, I joined the uh, Historical Society of Michigan when I was in Area 32, and they were great. They had all kinds of workshops uh, about every other month and uh, on everything from preserving photographs uh, to organizing collections, um, indexing, um, just all kinds of useful stuff. And, and that's, that's good training. There's training on the website. Uh, GSO has given us a whole bunch of great training materials. So we, we need to suck this in from wherever we can because good ideas are not uh, it just from one source. Um, are we careful to preserve the anonymity of AA members, both living and deceased, at the level of press, radio, films, television, and new electronic media, including the Internet? I'm, I'm a web guy, I like to make websites, and in Area 32 I was not only the archives chair, I was the uh, webmaster. And that's a dangerous combination because I, <laughs> I wanted to put everything up on the web. <clears throat> and I had to restrain myself, and fortunately my committee was helpful with that too. As we went through these things like, no, oh, I can't put the minutes up on a web because there's everybody's names in them. Um, we can, we can uh, put some pamphlets, some background history about AA, but there are a lot of things that we just can't share at that level. Um, <clears throat> do committee members willingly participate in work projects? And that gets back to motivating them, showing them that there's something that they can do that is actually helpful and constructive and moves the project forward. Are all significant decisions related to archives made by an informed group conscience? Um, Gail talked about that some. And it's, it's our job, I think, as archivists and as archives chairpersons to, to help to educate our committees and t tell them what these things mean, what the questions mean that are coming up. So give them a little background. Um, Anonymity was mentioned, you know, and, and I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, they're dead, it doesn't matter now. So we can educate them on the conference advisory actions. Um, do we provide secure storage locations for archival holdings that are safe from heat, fire, water, light, and insect damage, and that's not in a member's home, or worse yet, in the trunk of their car? <coughs> that's been done. Um, fairly obvious, but this is uh, part of this question is how do we differentiate between what is a, a collection that belongs to a person and what is the archives that belongs to your group. Um, if it's in somebody's home, uh, it's already suspect and it may not be labeled clearly. Um, 
that's another good reason to catalog everything and another good reason for a deed of gift so we have documentation as to what belongs to the group and what may have been brought out of the best intentions like oh I, brought, I got these great old big books and I can bring them and show them along with the archive stuff um, I've been not involved but in the aftermath of exactly that kind of situation where a collector had to extricate his stuff from some other materials and then there was a lot of hard feelings because oh he stole this from the archives and he said no it's my stuff well you know there's we don't need controversy like that so by being clear in our minds and clear in our documentation and clear in our storage we can prevent that uh, does the committee work to increase awareness of the archives and of AA history at the group and district levels by bringing displays to local events and conducting workshops at the local level? That was another thing the Historical Society was great at was they had several uh, workshops about making effective displays because most of the members of the Historical Society were kind of at the same level as us. They were working with a few volunteers and really limited budgets. Uh, when I joined them, I thought it was all going to be, you know, the uh, uh, some big statewide uh, uh, archives that was going to be in there. But it was mostly like your hometown Historical Society. You know, a foundation bought a house and they had some pictures of the guy who settled that, that small town. And so the, the archivist, the historian who's operating that is underpaid, has to deal with volunteers who are semi-skilled at best, and they have little or no budget. So very much like where we're coming from. Very helpful to, to be in their seminars because they're at a real practical down-to-earth level. Um, <clears throat> Does the committee have ongoing projects to collect old timers oral histories and group histories? Are there other active historical research projects? Man, Area 33 has just been going gangbusters. And I don't see them here today, but they've been going gangbusters on doing library research and uh, going to hospitals and everywhere they can think of and turning up information about the, the history of AA in Detroit. Um, and I think they're a, they're a terrific example of that. Um, and old timer oral histories, they're a, they're a stitch to do. I, I don't know why people are shy about interviewing old timers because it's a lot of fun. Does the group have clear financial policies regarding reimbursing legitimate expenses with prior committee approval and not purchasing acquisitions? This is another thing where we can avoid controversy by being clear and organized and having it written down in our guidelines. <clears throat> Which leads us to, does the committee have written guidelines and procedures to aid the archivist and volunteers in performing basic tasks? Is there a written collection scope? That's been talked about. Is a deed of gift or equivalent used to document acquisitions as part of the accessioning process? A good deed of gift will have several sections in it, and I've got one I'll show tomorrow. Um, it talks about uh, who owns the rights to the, to the document, um, who owns the copyright, and uh, what the terms are that it's being handed over under. The, the donor has to understand that the archives can do pretty much whatever they want with it within the limits of anonymity. Uh, so if it needs to be deaccessioned, it's going to be deaccessioned. Are these reviewed periodically and revised as needed? Number 14, does the archivist maintain a written inventory of holdings such as a finding aid? Um, as Gail said, you know, many of us went through the stage where, oh yeah, I know where everything is. <clears throat> and um, then eventually you don't, either because the collection has grown or <clears throat> in my case, I've gotten older and I forgot. Um, it happens. So a written finding aid also helps when we rotate out. We may not rotate that often, but am I going to impart all of my memory to my successor? I don't know how to do that other than writing it down. And that way, if somebody wants to research the history of our area, it doesn't need to be an outsider and we're worried about are they going to have access to this. It could be the Archives Committee wants to research it. 
but if we don't have a finding aid, we're not going to know where the information is. And finally, does the archives respect the copyright limitations on the holdings in the collections? And I think there'll be more on that later too. So uh, that's what I got. And as I said, I think the techies are going to post this. Um, I welcome input. There's certainly improvements to be made to it, but I think it's a start and something that we need to think about. So thank you.